A piece of sweet gatto, a delicious chocolate bar, hazelnut chocolate. All the sugar we shovel into ourselves day after day. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Newton. Yes, you will say, I know the story about sugar. Too much is not healthy, and it certainly helps me gain weight. But you'll be surprised to learn how much sugar is in what, and how it really affects the body. So look and listen. Two students at breakfast. Lisa starts her day with fresh fruit and muesli. Alma, on the other side, with very sweet chocolate cornflakes. While one breakfast is protein rich and has fiber, the other one consists almost entirely of easily available carbohydrates. Even the orange juice out of the Tetra Pak has added sugar. Both are full, but the hormones in both bodies could not react more differently. For Lisa, it takes a fair amount of time until the complex carbohydrates and the fiber is changed into blood sugar. Alma's energy is instantly available. The sugar activates the pancreas. Large amounts of insulin are produced. The insulin moves the sugar from the blood to the cells. Lisa feels full for hours after breakfast because the energy from her breakfast metabolizes slowly and steadily. For Alma, the insulin rush turns very quickly into a decline in blood sugar. Her stomach feels empty. The next sugar fix is needed. As soon as we taste something sweet, primeval instincts are awoken in our brain, similar to us wandering through the forest and stumbling upon a huge area of ripe blueberries. The taste of sweet is actually the only sense of taste that tells us that there is energy in food. And immediately, there is the urge to consume the food, to use the energy, so no one else can have it, not even an animal who would want to use it for the same reason. The competition is there, that's why humans have a physiological urge to find energy. And a lot of it comes to us through the taste of sweetness. Jürgen Koenig and his team at the Department for Nutrition Science at the University of Vienna work on feeding experiments with worms. They study how different kinds of sugar affect the life expectancy of model worm C. It looks as if the worms are not doing well at all in the land of sugar and sweets. For a short time, they are highly active and lay eggs very quickly, but the more sugar they consume, the earlier they die. When we reduce the energy, the worm lives a third longer than the one who can consume as much energy as it wants. Reproduction starts early during a time of abundance. Healthy young genes are passed on. With this, the worm has fulfilled its evolutionary role. C can go. The purpose of nature is to keep the species alive. Our own purpose, brutally put, is to reproduce, and that's it. After that, we're not needed anymore. As soon as we have reproduced, we can die. Well, as long as we have reproduced in a way, our species can go on. All living organisms are programmed to eat, as long as there is food available. In the past, this was important, so in good times, reserve fat could be put on to be used in times of need. Today, we are in conflict with our instincts. The berry fields of the cooling shelf in the supermarket offer berries all year round. An adult should not consume more than 60 grams of sugar per day, children correspondingly less. In reality, many eat a lot more. 
it becomes harder to judge when sugar is hidden in products to lure out our primeval instincts. The Organization for Consumer Information recently tested a variety of products and discovered a number of sugar traps. Here are a few of the winners. One sugar cube stands for three grams of sugar. This diet drink is loaded. Two bottles of this are enough to fill the recommended daily limit for an adult. Small, but powerful. Yes, pickled vegetables can contain sugar too. Someone who drinks a whole bottle of our winner has to fight through a wall of 33 cubes. In spite of this, the new lifestyle advertises impertinently that it contains little fat. Sugar is the number one cause of being overweight. In Austria, half of all adult men and a third of women are overweight. 12% are considered heavily overweight, with a body mass index of more than 30. In the U.S., the situation seems to be totally out of control. Smoking was seen as the biggest risk factor for the last few decades, but recently a more dangerous influence crept in. Food. There is no diet that really works so far. Are the Americans caught in the sugar trap? Ingrid Kiefer from the Agency for Health and Food Security, AGES, notes a possible cause. In the 70s, the Americans started to replace normal, white sugar, also called cane or beet sugar, with corn syrup that contains fructose. It is used in vast amounts. It was considered a modern alternative, and we took over this trend. These syrups are a mixture of fructose and glucose. In the U.S., high fructose corn syrup is made from cornstarch with the help of genetically modified enzymes. The farming industry was cheering on this new market. They were able to sell all their excess corn and the food industry was happy about this easy to use product, especially since fructose is much sweeter than glucose. Unfortunately, the food strategists overlooked a little detail. Glucose and fructose have a very different metabolism and interact very differently with our hormones. How significant this difference is, is shown in one of the latest studies. The participants test drinking water sweetened with the same amount of either glucose or fructose. This is the sugar water. Please drink it within two minutes. The goal of this study is to see the different effects these two sugars have on the metabolism. With the help of an MRI, it is possible to measure the activity in important parts of the brain. Here fructose shows almost no reaction at all. Glucose, on the other hand, shows a very calming effect in the satiety region. It also reduces the release of the appetite-enhancing hormone ghrelin into the bloodstream. Fructose goes straight to the liver. The brain is one of the few organs that needs glucose as an energy reserve. It cannot process fructose. Fructose typically is completely metabolized in the liver and stored as fat immediately, but doesn't send any signals to the brain. In other words, the fructose metabolism completely bypasses the brain. Fructose activates other areas. It triggers a much stronger feeling of hunger than glucose-rich foods. With the latter, we reach a feeling of being full fairly quickly, which also changes the blood circulation. Fructose doesn't have this effect. We still feel hungry. Fructose and glucose are responsible for the majority of foods we consider sweet. This is our regular household sugar, a mix of half fructose and half glucose. We colored the glucose red, the fructose green. 
Natural food usually contains fructose and glucose in equal amounts. In a banana, it is two to two. The same in an orange. Apples have slightly less fructose. Fructose occurs naturally and therefore has the image of a healthy sugar. It is natural in fruit. However, the big advantage of eating fruit like an apple is that we not only eat sugar, but also vitamins, minerals, and fiber, things that keep us healthy. Fruit itself contains noticeably less sugar than its juice. When apples are made into juice, most of the fruit stays in the press, so the sweetness becomes more concentrated. The sugar content doubles. Very few people eat three apples or oranges at once, but a glass of juice is downed very quickly. Many underestimate the amount of sugar they consume. The intake of fructose in fruit and vegetables is naturally limited because no one eats a kilo of apples a day. It is very easy, though, to drink a liter of fruit juice. Our wish is that everyone eats their fruit and doesn't only drink it. Some product labels state that they do not contain added sugar but the concentrate contains a fair amount, too. The same here in this drink sweetened with glucose only. Or this extra sweet fruit bar. It takes a lot of willpower to resist our primal instinct to eat sweets. Maybe imagination can help. At the University of Vienna, they conducted an experiment. One group of participants was asked to think intensely of gummy bears, while the control group was supposed to imagine putting a coin in a vending machine. Next, both groups were given gummy bears to eat and to evaluate them by color and taste. The results were significantly different. We discovered that the group we asked to think of food before the test ate less than the ones who had to think of using the vending machine. Maybe we can make it a trendy new sport. Mental self-defense against the sugar rush. Guess how many sugar cubes are in this smoothie? It is a fruit juice made from banana, raspberries and apple. Believe it or not, it contains eight sugar cubes. Oh well, maybe I'll abandon sugar and use sugar replacement products, sweeteners. Sorry, I have to disappoint you. Science offers very sobering facts. Elizabeth Jaeger has been battling weight problems for years. She has tried every diet and tries to eat as few calories as possible. In my family, on both my parents' sides, all were heavily overweight. I actually did rather well until I was 35. After I had my children, I practically exploded. Desperately, she tried to control her weight with calorie-free sweeteners. Cyclamate, saccharin, and others added the sweetness to her life. Advertising continuously told us that sugar was evil. We need to live sugar-free and use artificial sweeteners. For me, it led to the fatal opposite. 
I started out to lose weight at 115 kilograms and ended up on the table in the operating room at 148 kilograms. Over time, I have lost about 180 kilograms, but sadly gained 210 kilograms. The artificial sweeteners contributed to this a good deal. Artificial sweeteners are an important part of the light wave. This is how the food industry responds to the need for low-calorie foods. A pioneer in this market was a sweetener saccharin more than 100 years ago. In the early 1980s, aspartame joined. Today, it sweetens more than 5,000 products. Relatively new is stevia, the extract of a South American plant. In principle, the sweetener docks onto the receptor of the tongue, like sugar does, and triggers the taste of sweetness. Household sugar has a sweetness factor of one. In comparison to that, fructose is twice as sweet. Aspartame is 300 times sweeter, and stevia between 300 and 600 times sweeter. This results in the fact that the sweetness sensors are activated 300 times more than by the use of regular sugar. Shortly after sweeteners hit the market, the battle began against the market giant sugar. Both sides use underhanded tactics. Sugar was stamped as an evil killer. Sweeteners were accused of causing cancer. Neither side offered any scientific evidence. But in I must say, artificial sweeteners are a million dollar market. In spite of the huge number of people exposed to them, there have been very, very few controlled studies done. A year ago, there was a systematic fact-finding done on how many controlled studies there really are. The number of test persons was only around 700. In this study, they only invited young people of average weight for a few days for breakfast. Every person ate about the same number of calories. Some cornflakes were sweetened with sugar, others with artificial sweeteners. Supplementary food was added to make up for the saved calories in the cornflakes. People could eat until they felt full. The only noticeable difference was seen in people that were told that they were eating the low-calorie cornflakes. These participants in the light group often took this knowledge as carte blanche to have an extra piece of cake. On average, they consumed 820 calories, while the group who did not know only consumed 600 calories, clearly less. If people are given artificial sweeteners in a controlled study, they will lose weight. However, as soon as they are in their regular environment, it stops. In everyday life, there is no control, and the saved calories are replaced. For example, with the thought, I had a diet drink, so I can have a second burger. For years, Elizabeth Yeager paid very close attention that all her food and drinks were light. From soda to yogurt drinks, she swore by aspartame and company. The results were depressing. Light products. Certainly I used light products. However, the result was that every time I had a light drink, I got hungry. So half a pig on a bun was just the portion I longed for. The effect is not unknown. This is a vicious cycle. I assume I save something, take in more, and still feel hungry. This is the reason why we eat. We want to feel satisfied. If we do not reach this state, we have another portion. In the end, we don't save anything by using artificial sweeteners. Finally, Mrs. Jaeger had enough of diets. She went for the radical method of surgery, band and bypass. Yes, the suffering was great because I couldn't even do things with my children anymore. I sent my friend with them to the playground. I was the mom sitting on the couch. Not fun at all. Science is still very much at the beginning of understanding the immediate effect of sugar on the brain.
The hypothalamus is a small area of the brain. It weighs about 4 grams. Compared to the 1300 grams of an average human brain, it is size-wise relatively unimportant, but it regulates about 80% of our daily activities, such as sleep, waking up, thirst, hunger and sex. Ewald Mose and his team wanted to find out if and how sugar affects emotions. While a test person is in the MRI tube, photos that should trigger certain emotions are shown via a mirror system. One third of the images are sad. One third neutral and the rest happy funny. The MRI records the reaction of the areas in the brain that influence our urge to look for food. In test persons with a higher sugar content in their blood, these brain areas clearly reacted more slowly. Sugar calms the urge to eat. The researchers doubt that artificial sweeteners do the same. In our experiment, we realized that even when we doubled the normal blood sugar level, the behavior did not change. But the activity in the brain did. When the glucose level in the blood gets lower, the hypothalamus becomes more active. If the glucose level is higher than the brain needs it to be, it slows down. The processing of emotions is directly related to knowing we have eaten enough. How this relates to artificial sweeteners is, to a large extent, unknown. Some of the artificial sweeteners pass through the blood-brain barrier. There are not enough studies done on how they affect the satiety center of the hypothalamus. The main point about all of these sweeteners is that they do not provide the feeling of being full, in spite of having eaten something sweet. With the same amount of food, the feeling of being full comes much later. Elizabeth Jaeger founded the obesity self-help group for heavily overweight people all over Austria. She collected the experiences of uncountable fellow sufferers. Sadly, I don't know one person that lost weight permanently with the help of artificial sweeteners. It simply doesn't work. It's just an advertising gimmick, nothing else. Today, if she feels she wants something sweet, she reaches for a piece of real chocolate and enjoys it, rarely, but intensely. Yes, and this is what I've learned from the story as well. Have something sweet, not too much, but truly enjoy it. Goodbye.